Uh, welcome to Strategic Ideas uh, class, uh, Singfield Cup style. And also, as you all know, you at home and, and here, uh, tomorrow is my birthday. And slightly more importantly for the Singfield Cup, Saturday is Rex's birthday. So I think we're the same age. Anyway, I forgot because I was born a long time ago. Um, I want to talk about the hedgehog today because that seems like a strategic idea. Um, I talked about it a little bit in the beginner's class because I was playing Galfand, and if you're going to talk about a beginner, what, Galfand, right? <laughs> Is that good? Did I just the right person? Okay, so it's not like he just won the tall memorial. Although I actually, I forgot. Uh, let's call on someone. Uh, Joe, yeah. how do you do against MVL? Okay, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so, uh, the reason I want to talk about this, this opening is because it's very strategic, so it's good for that. And I had two hedgehogs in the Michigan Open, which I just finished. And my student, Matt Larson, when he plays the hedgehog, he loses all of his games and he hates the hedgehog. So I only lost one game. I didn't lose all my games. Now the hedgehog is sort of a pawn structure you can get from several different openings. Now those of you who know Komsky and Ray Robson, well first I take 10 minutes out to diss Ray Robson. No. Okay, Komsky and Ray Robson in the US Championship, either this year or last year, I don't remember that. Uh, in this position, who remembers what Komsky played? I guess it was last year, not this year. You. It was this year, he played the Kamsky in the sixth. Right, but that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, last year, what did he play in this position? A shocking move. He played B6. Okay, yeah, very suspicious. And the game ended in a draw. And they played this year and the game ended in a draw, so I guess all games end in a draw. You can actually get hedgehog type positions um, from almost every opening. Now, one of the first hedgehogs is not well known, was played by White. And that was the game, yeah, they don't know. I think it was Fisher Ulf Anderson. And Fisher was White and played the hedgehog with White somehow. And he won a really nice game. He played King H1, Rook G1, and mated him. So awesome. Okay, find that game, it's from the early 70s. Uh, maybe late 60s? Yeah, 68 to 72 was somewhere in there. Okay, now, uh, the first game I had to hedgehog was in round four? No, I didn't play round four. Round five. It was round four for me, I took a bye. And my opponent was Alexander Dietrich. And I have a very funny Alexander Dietrich story, and nobody on YouTube will tell me I'm making fun of anybody, even though I am, because they don't know who he is. Alexander Dietrich is um, sort of like Cliff Clavin from, from Cheers. Sort of like a know-it-all but doesn't know anything. But he's very young. This was when he was like eight. So I would be teaching a chess camp in Michigan and he was rated 900 maybe. And I would show a game. He re Excuse me, Grandmaster Feingold. I wasn't even a Grandmaster then. Isn't this similar to the game Steinitz, somebody from 1870? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he would always be right. Isn't this this game? And isn't, didn't he play this way? And I'm like, what? And he did this every time. He knew everything. He was always right, though. And I'm like, why is he 900? He knows everything. And now he's 2100, but like four years later. But he, he knew everything. Okay? And then uh, the reason I'm telling this story is I was at the Chicago Open. I had my usual bad tournament. And I had to give a ride home to national tournament director Glenn Panner, who's also an expert at chess. And on the way home, he said, there was this guy in the tournament, and he was telling me the sign says the legal amount of people in this room is 175 by the fire marshal, but there's 800 here, and he was yelling at me. And I was like, wait a minute, was this Alexander Dietrich? And he's like, yeah. So like, all I knew was that he complained about the sign, I knew it was Alexander Dietrich, even though there was 800 people there. And then he explained to him there were things kind of, you know, that. It wasn't one room, it was several rooms in there, yeah. Okay, so uh, this guy's a stickler, right? He's, you know, theory and write good notes and Steinitz and there's too many people in this room. So this guy knows, he knows what he's doing. He doesn't, he doesn't just like play random moves and hope that it's theory. This guy knows what he's doing. So I'm playing Alexander Dietrich. Now last year, I also played Alexander Dietrich and it was a drawn position and he blundered and I won. So I had to get my revenge for him having a drawn position. And his rating's about 2100, and he's approximately 14 years old. He's within a year either way. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And Alexander played uh, uh, C4. Okay, and I played C5. 
and we did we did some of this stuff. Okay, and he played G3, and then all the G6, and all kinds of you know, uh, Bishop G7. Okay, castles. Now this is technically not a hedgehog, so that's why I won. Technically, but it has the same ideas. Okay, takes takes. Now this is an English symmetrical English, and uh, in a hedgehog, black is always fianchettoing his, his bishop on b7. Okay, and sometimes black fianchettoes his bishop, and sometimes he doesn't. For the real super hedgehog positions, you'll see the game that I lost. And this position, uh, I analyzed with Gregory Kaidanov before anybody was born, including me and Gregory. So it was, analysis was a little iffy. And, uh, we looked at the move knight g4 because that was mm, maybe the fifth most common move, maybe the fourth. And we did a lot of analysis, but since it was 20 years ago, I don't remember much of it, but I've played it several times. Most of my opponents think forever here. They're like, what, knight g4? Now knight g4 obviously attacks this. Now when I say hedgehog, the people who are sticklers, although the main stickler left, Alex Marler, he would say this isn't a hedgehog because you didn't feed and cattle your bishop and your pawn's not in the third rank. But the ideas are very similar. White has a space advantage. White's feed and cattle his king bishop and white stopping d5. So black has very little play. But black gets to move around and be solid and eventually trick white. Although this game was much trickier than that. And so, uh, well, I'm attacking his knight. Okay. So he played e3, which I think is the best move. And he's attacking my knight. Okay. And I play d6, defending my knight. Very strange chess. And I'm sacrificing a pawn, which I've had a couple people accept, but I mean, they end up losing. Uh, I think taking the pawn is actually bad. I think black gets too much play on the diagonal and the b file, and the bishop is on c6, which is terrible. Uh, my opponent played b3, which I think is a good move. And he's going to fianchetto his bishop. And in normal hedgehog style, I would have to fianchetto my bishop, which is virtually impossible here. So I played uh, queen to a5. I'm sorry, I played knight to e5. And he played h3. And again, nobody does anything and waits for the other. The strategic idea here uh, for both sides is you can't do anything, so when you eventually do something, it's going to be bad, so I'm going to protect everything. And for especially true for white, white's protecting everything in his position. If you look at all of these squares on the white side of the board, okay, they're all protected. I can't go anywhere. But I found a square anyway, because there's a lot of squares on the board. So I played queen here. Now we're going to vote, because voting is fun. And you will probably do better than my opponent, because he's not here to vote. You're going to vote to play either bishop to b2 or bishop to d2. So take a little time to think about it, and then we'll vote. He said as he sipped his Perrier. Who votes for bishop to b2? One, two, three. The cameraman's voting. Who votes for bishop to d2? Cameraman votes for both. It's four to four. Okay, so the answer is neither. No. Uh, my opponent played one move, but the other move is better. So he's like you guys. Okay, uh, Bishop d2 is the correct move. Right. And now the black queen is quite stupidly placed, I might add. Um, in fact, I think the computer wants me to play queen d8. But yeah, my queen is just terrible on a5. And he'll play rook c1 and so forth, queen e2. And it's hard for black to, to do anything. He played bishop to b2. And he's higher rated than all of you. So, okay. And he played bishop to b2. Okay. Now my queen can stay on a5 as long as it wants. It turned out it didn't want to stay there for very long. Now, one idea that black has in this opening is to change the pawn structure so we can attack. Knight takes d4, which I played, and knight to c6. And now I'm attacking the pawn. And my opponent played knight e2, which is fine. Other moves are also fine. And he defends his pawn. 
again, black is trying to get active play. And I played queen h5. And he thought for a long time. And I think it was a Harz V lecture. I think it was Ronan. Pretty sure it was Ronan. And he said something correct. So right away I was like, wow. Because I've, I've watched a lot of lectures in chess. And I've seen some funny ones. Ronan says a lot of things that are correct. So I'm always like really shocked. And uh, Ronan, usually when you get advice in chess books, you just, if you want to get better at chess, you should throw the book out. But in this instance, Ronan was right on the money. Man, did he say it right. He said, the longer you think, the more you don't know what you're doing. You think 20, 30, 40 minutes on a move, your move's no good. It's like, usually the move's not good. And then I, and then I was like, yeah, that guy's right. And not with, just with me, but with my opponents. When they think 20, 30, 40 minutes, their move's not going to be any good. There's a reason why they're thinking 30, 40 minutes. They, don't, they can't find a good move, and they don't understand what's going on, so they just sit there. And I've done that a lot. I've thought 30, 40 minutes, and I make a dumb move. And that's exactly what my opponent did here. He thought at least 20 minutes. And the move I was worried about wouldn't occur to any of you, especially Joe, who I already told. Okay? And the thing is, if I play bishop takes h3, which is the threat, which I would do if it was my move, he could play knight f4, forking my queen and bishop. However, I could then play queen takes queen. So if his queen wasn't there, I can't play bishop takes h3. So actually, the main moves I was looking at were queen d2 and queen e1. Queen d2, I was going to play bishop h6, I think, and queen e1... I think I was going to play g5 or maybe bishop h6. I can't take because of knight f4. Anyway, a very reasonable move would be knight f4. Okay, good move. Now, my opponent played a bad move, the kind of move low-rated players like to play, and that's why I'm higher rated than them, because they play moves that aren't as good. And this move weakens everything. And when you move pawns in front of your king, and your king has no protection, then things like what happened in this game happened in this game. And he played g4. And it was a 20-minute thing. Then I played this, and he then thought again, because the move he was planning on playing, he decided it was bad. His intention, he told me after the game, was f4, h5, g5, bishop takes h3, bishop f3, and my queen is trapped. And he forgot that his rook was attacked. He's like, that queen can't move. I'm going to win that queen eventually. Maybe bishop c3, d1. Now, I'm not convinced that he's 100% wrong. Maybe if I take the rook, he takes back with the queen, and my queen is trapped. But once he saw this, he's like, nah, I'm not doing this. I don't want to lose all this material. I'll exchange it upon and hope to win his queen later. And I didn't, well, when I looked at this with my computer, it, it did not suggest these moves for white. It doesn't like white in this variation. So now, after my response that he expected, he completely changed his mind. So that 20-minute thing did a lot of good, although for me. And once again, he, you know, sort of goes on tilt. <laughs> like, just sort of like playing super aggressive, crazy. Fa so he played d5. Uh, wait, he didn't play d5. That would hang his bishop. He played bishop c3. <clears throat> that would not hang his bishop. And I played f5. And I'm activating my rook. I'm attacking this pawn. Um, he doesn't want to take and let my pieces out. So he played f3. And his bishop is a little iffy. And to keep it iffy, I played f4. Now it sort of stays there. Uh, again, he should slowly but surely extricate his position with bishop e1, kicking my queen out, then probably bishop f2, defending his pawn, move these two pieces, and play bishop f1, and get his bishop back in the game. And it's about equal. But black's pretty happy. Um, but again, he's you know, trying to play aggressively, and plays d5, giving my knight this square. Not good. Uh, now, he decided his knight should go to this square. And if he was playing blitz chess outside an hour ago, he would have just gone here. Right, Julian? Okay. But he legally got his bishop. Now, what he should do, again, is play bishop to e1 and then move his knight there. But he played bishop to d4, so his knight could do that. 
And I played h5 because that's where all my pieces are. And he made the losing move, knight to c3, and now black is completely winning. I take, he takes, and I sacrifice my bishop. Now I have to tell you, I, I play bridge with a chess master named Wes Berger. And Wes is not a good bridge player, but he probably used to be a good bridge player. He's a little long in the tooth now. And he was a good chess player. He was 2300. And uh, when Wes plays bridge, if he does something aggressive, that means you really blundered because he doesn't do anything aggressive. So when he does, then boy, you in trouble. That means you really deserved it. Uh, in chess, he's sort of similar, as Julian will attest to, two boring draws. So the same can be said for me. When I sacrifice a piece, man, are you in trouble? Unless you're Aronian, then I sacrifice six pieces. <laughs> but if I sacrifice a piece in a slow game, that means you're losing, because I don't sacrifice pieces. So when I play bishop takes g4, you're in a lot of trouble, because I don't like giving my bishop away. And he took my bishop. And I played knight takes. And I'm threatening queen h2 checkmate with advantage. And I didn't sack a piece and threaten mate and then not analyze it. I figured it all the way out. What move would white make that would stop checkmate? Because that would be bad if you got checkmated. You. I'll wait. I got nothing to do. <laughs> Rook f3. So it's echo in here. Now his king has a flight square. And Rook f3 is the move that I looked at. Um, also good, if I wanted to calculate many, many, many more variations, was instead of threatening mate to play f3 right away. Also a good move, which computer recommended. But, okay, Re computer also said this wins. Now, I played a move which I knew won. I knew I won material. I knew I was mating him. But even better was to play queen h2 and knight e3 check. And he has to take with the bishop. And I take. And even though I'm down a piece, I'm threatening bishop takes knight. And I'm also threatening rook takes rook. And if bishop takes, I have queen f2 mate. And if queen takes, rook to f8 wins his queen. And I'm threatening the knight. And it's pinned. So he's incredibly lost. Computer says I'm up between six and seven. Okay? But I couldn't find this because I was all sixes and sevens. Right, Ken West? The only person who's ever heard that phrase. Like, what? OK, so I played something that I knew won that didn't win as much. I'm only plus 2.7. Terrible. I played bishop takes check. And then I played check. And then I played knight e3, because now bishop takes knight is illegal due to the fact that there's no bishop there. So rook takes knight should be illegal, because pawn takes check. And then, man, you don't want to have white here, because Bad stuff's going to happen when I take that. So he must play king e2, and I take with check, and rook f2. And when I sacrificed a piece, I saw this position and noticed I was up two pawns, and that I have a knight here, and his king is running around. I was like, ah, oh, that's a good position. And I checked, and he moved his king. And I played queen to f5, and he didn't want me to play queen c2, so he played knight to e4. I attacked his rook. He saw it. I attacked his rook again. He saw it. And now I played for a trick, um, a very hard trick to see. Unless you're a computer, then it's very easy. But if you're human, it's not easy. Um, computer doesn't like my move because it sees my trick. And then it stops it and says I'm winning, but not as winning as before. My opponent had about a minute left to make five or six moves. So I didn't think he would see my trick. Somehow I was right. I played queen h3, which looks like it threatens knight f3 check, because it does threaten knight f3 check. Um, but uh, yeah. So he should play rook to g1. And then if I play knight f3, which I wouldn't do, he would take it and then take on g6, and he has a winning attack probably. Um, so rook g1 is the best move, and I was going to play rook f5. But my opponent saw knight f3, but didn't see my other threat. So he played rook to f1. I didn't think he'd see my other threat, so I was right. Uh, and my move still wins, so it's not terrible. And I played my next move, and my opponent resigned immediately, without letting me hit the clock even. Very nice of him. 
waste my time hitting the clock. So this move actually sets up a combination of three consecutive forks. So I fork, then I fork the next move, and then I fork the next move. Ken West is enthralled. J Julian. I played queen e3, and he resigned, which was best. Notice his king and queen are attacked, so queen takes queen is forced. I fork again, so king takes pawn is forced. And then I fork again, and I get a rook. And I have a rook and a pawn for a knight. And unless you're Edward Lasker, did you actually get that? A rook and a pawn beats a knight. No, not none of you. Anybody at home? You got it? Really? Nice. Uh, there was a famous game between Lasker and Lasker. I think it was Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep. And uh, it was rook and pawn versus knight, and there was nothing else on the board, but it was a draw. I think it was New York 24. Julian's like, yeah, I'll just say yes. Yeah, New York 1924. Yeah, I mean, obviously. And he resigned because there's so many pieces on the board. My rook and pass pawn will tell. OK, so that was not a hedgehog, but it was close. It was almost a hedgehog. Now, I also played in round two of this event, I'm going backwards in time, an actual hedgehog. Incredible. And this was actually very strange. I've never seen this in my life. In round one of an open tournament, which had 34 players, so one plays 18, two plays 19, and so forth. In the open section, the lower rated players won. They won. The lower rated players scored more than the higher rated players. I've never seen that happen. And in round one, I played a 1906. And in round two, I played a 1900. Because the lower rated players won. They beat the higher rated players. Uh, they got a plus score. Now on board two, the gentleman that I played in round two was on board two the previous round. I was watching his game, and he was getting crushed. And he was down material, and his opponent was 2250. And, but he won. I don't, I don't know how he won. I didn't see. So, yeah. so he, he won. Yeah, if you were rated 2200 this tournament, you lost a lot of rating points. There were like three guys, and they all withdrew and went home crying. So I didn't play any of them, because they all lost all their games. Now, this guy uh, played actual hedgehog. He played b6, or I did. And I actually had two real hedgehogs this tournament. I'm like the fake ones from the other tournament. Knight here, here, yeah, castles, uh, bishop e7, played b3. Oh no, he played e4 very early, but not here. I think because I'm transposing. So, well, I'll get to the I'll get to the hedgehog position since I can't remember how we got to it. But, and he played queen d2. I, I apologize. He didn't fianchetto his king bishop. That's why I couldn't remember. This is what he did. The fianchetto was my last round. OK. And he put his rooks in the middle. And I castled. He played king h1, which I thought was a bit odd. But what do I know? Rook c8, rook c1, queen c7, all very not too exciting. And this structure is very interesting um, because both sides have to figure out what their opponent wants to do and then not let them do it. And it's not clear what you want to do. It's not so simple. Now, the way they play the hedgehog now, this setup with black putting all his pawns here, is to play rook c8, queen c7, which I did, and then queen b8, bishop c7, bishop d8 to c7. And then when you play d5 on some day in your life, you're attacking h2. And then when you play rook e8, your rook isn't blocked by the bishop, and sometimes you put your knight on g6. And 25 years ago, nobody did this. Most people put their bishop here, and occasionally they would fianchetto their bishop. But usually they would just leave it here. Nobody thought about lying the queen and bishop up here. But, you know, I read stuff. And I actually did this once, but I didn't play rook c8. And my rook was on a8 for 70 moves. So that was unfortunate. OK, now, uh, my opponent 
played a couple of strange moves. He played here. I don't know why he's retreating. OK, this is here. I'm sorry. And I played this. And I was all ready to play bishop here, bishop here. And he played queen e1. Oh, I'm sorry. I played. It's my move here. I played rook e8. And he played queen e1. And I was ready to play bishop here, bishop here. But I thought his queen would go to h4. And my bishop should probably be on this diagonal. Uh, yeah, so this is actually the correct position. So this is quite strange because generally you want to put your rook on the same file as your mm -hmm. opponent's queen. So when his rook was here and my queen was here, I moved my queen out of the way. That way no funny stuff would happen. My opponent conversely moved his queen to the file of my rook thinking, well, that file's closed. I don't care. Okay. Well, if the file's closed and you don't care, maybe I should open that file up. So I played d5. And in the, in the, in the hedgehog, you want to play either d5 or b5 and open things up for your pieces. Well, if his queen is here and his other pieces are here, I would like my rook to capture all of them. Then I'm the favorite, unless I'm playing Aronian. So d5, and computer strangely says it's the best move. Takes, takes, takes. And now, computer wants me to play b5 and like harass this knight and harass. And it says black is better. But I played bishop to d6 because I, I did what I wanted to do. I'm attacking the pawn. I opened my rook up. And my opponent played the expected move, queen to h4, getting off of this and defending his pawn. And I assumed when he played queen e1, he wanted to play queen h4. Now, one thing that I do that most of you don't do, and that's why I'm slightly higher rated than most of you. Levon's not here, right? OK, good. And you're not watching at home, are you, Levon? One of the things I do is I imagine where my pieces can go, where they would be good, and then I try to put my pieces there. And then if I get there, I win, unless I was wrong to start with, which would be terrible. And in this position, since I have two pieces attacking h2, my queen and my bishop, I wanted to get more pieces attacking h2. And so I played the very unusual move, rook to e5, because I want to play rook to h5. Now, if you've watched chess at the chess club before, or watched chess videos, or have followed Jen Shahadi's career, you may notice she likes the term rover, where you move your rook up and over. And you know, that happens sometimes. Maybe not as often as Jen says, but it happens. Um, in fact, before Jennifer mentioned these ideas, I had discussions with Gregory Kaidanov about the fact that we both like doing that. We like moving our rook up and, and over, both of us. And uh, a friend of mine who's a relatively new chess student, and she's a friend too, she always says, send me your games, send me your games, send me your games. So I send her my games. Okay. And this tournament, she sent me a text and she says, you, you like to move your rooks up and over a lot. And I was like, I, I guess. Okay. And this is an example. So I want to play rook h5 with advantage, big advantage. Now, g4 is a little suspicious because you know your king is getting exposed. After f4, I could just move my rook back, and f4 is pretty weakening. Or I could play rook takes bishop, knight takes rook, bishop takes f4. And Ulf Anderson would be proud of me because I sacked the exchange and I have all the dark squares and the knights pinned. And I'm going to play rook e8 and queen e5. So this is also fine for black. My opponent played another move I analyzed, which I thought lost, and I was right, which is bishop f4. And after rook h5, the bishop is hanging and the queen is hanging. So takes and takes. Now, if this is the beginner's class, it's not far from it, then I would not expect anybody to find the right move here for white. But with such a fine audience as yourselves, can you find the only move white can play to avoid immediate loss? That would lose the queen. So, no. Knight e4. Very good. Okay. And the idea is, 
you attack my queen, I attack your queen, and if the knight takes the knight, the knight is no longer defending the rook, because it took the knight, and the rook is hanging. And I saw this when I played rook e5, and I correctly calculated it. It's never happened before. I took the knight, he took the rook, and I played knight f2 check, he played the best move, and I took the rook. Now white has two ways to capture the knight with the rook or the bishop. With the rook would be bad, because I would take his knight, so I took with the bishop. Now, I didn't play the winning move because I didn't see it. That's good reason. I actually did see the first move, I didn't see the second move. I saw queen c5 check, king h1, and now I did not see queen to b5, which threatens queen f1 mate with advantage, and queen takes b2, which also is pretty strong, and computer says I'm winning, but I didn't see queen b5. Double attack, very nice. I saw something else, and I thought it would happen, and I thought it was happening, and then it didn't happen. Story of my life, but not about chess necessarily. Okay, so I played queen f4, attacking the rook. The rook moved away. I think he went to a1. Could have gone to b1 too. a1's harder for me to reach, so he probably went there. Okay, and then I played knight to f6. If you know what the word plethora means, you will know that white does not have a plethora of squares for his queen. Okay? And I'm positive, even though I don't know what positive means. And if you saw Django, that's funny. Okay, so knight f6, tagging the queen, and he moved his queen here. And I had this all worked out. I played, what did I play? Oh yeah, wait, did I play that? Yes, I played queen d2. I had it all worked out. And now I thought the game would end in two moves, but it ended in 2,000 moves instead. Yeah. I thought I was threatening rook takes knight, and that he wouldn't want me to play that. If he moves his knight, I play queen e1 mate. I didn't think he wanted me to play that either. So I thought he would defend his knight with, well, then I would take his rook. Queen f5. That's what I expected. Then. I would play rook e8, threatening rook e1, which would give checkmate next move. He would stop checkmate, let's say h3, that stops checkmate. And then I would play the move he couldn't possibly see. So this is what I expected the whole time. Black to play and win in one move. Winning is good because you win. If you're listening at home, write that down. <laughs> this is the winning move. It gives black a big advantage due to the fact that it wins. And this is my kind of move. This is my style. You guys are sacking all your pieces. This is my style. Retreat, MVL, Frenchman. Yeah. Hmm? Bishop C8. And now you'll notice the queen has nowhere to go. Aw. So I thought that would happen, because I thought he would never see that. And I thought wrong, as usual. So after queen to d2, my opponent picked up his queen, and I was like, yes, queen f5, rook e8, and he played queen g3. And I was like, hmm, if I take his knight, take, take, queen b8 check could be annoying. And Maybe I could trade queens, but I'm not sure if I'm winning that endgame. This rook comes out, and my king. And I was like, eh, that might be winning. I don't know. And I was like, all right, this is the worst pieces ever. I'm not going to trade them all off. So I just took my pawn back. Okay. Now he went back to playing badly. He was like looking at, oh, time to play badly. He played queen f2, which isn't the worst move. And now he played the worst move. He played queen g3. And after queen f6, he has some issues down here. And, well, this reminded me of something. Usually when you learn how to play better chess, you see some tactic, then you go to your, you know, on a book or an online, or you solve some tactical puzzles. Then you go online, you go online, then you go to your tournament, and your opponent makes this blunder, and you're like, aha, I know this tactic, and you win. Question? If, if I see a tactic, I always say you. No, you can't do that. If you could, then I would have won. Yeah. Then I could go here, but not all the way to here. Okay. So 
Uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So you're playing a tournament game, and you're like, aha, I saw this tactic before. And then you win, and you're great. Ken West knows what I'm talking about. Anyway, this reminded me of a game that I lost where I played terribly. Except my opponent had that position. I was like, oh, that's good for me. My opponent plays like I did when I lost. And what it reminded me of that? The bishop on d1. If you're watching at home and you have a database, or you can go online, find the game from the 2012 Chicago Open, find gold Ivan Isevich, and you'll see my bishop on d1. And when the game ended, Ivan Isevich is like, yeah, well, you wish it went to d1. That's, that ain't, that ain't no good. Then you're going to lose. And his range 26, 60 feet A, so he's right. Yeah, he crushed me. I haven't crushed that bad in a while. Not since like three days ago or, or an hour ago. That's throwing you. Okay, so when his vision was on D1, I was like, yes, that's, Bishop shouldn't be on D1. Brock and his rook, terrible. Now he proceeded to sacrifice all of his pawns. Very suspicious. Yeah, I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he was thinking Arby's. He played Queen E1, and I was like, all right. And then he played F4, and I was like, all right. And then he attacked my bishop, and I was like, all right. No. No, no, I, he, he did not resign this game. All right. So he attacked my knight, but I saw it. If my knight moves away, he takes my bishop. See, sneaky. So I defended my knight. Then he attacked my pawn, and I defended my pawn. Then he attacked it again. But he's not really attacking, it's defended. Now it's my turn to do stuff. This reminds me of something quite funny. Uh, I was reading a bridge article on bridge, which makes sense. It was a bridge article. And a guy who was world-class, world-famous player was playing with his wife, who is not world-class and not world-famous. She's a beginner, but she wants to play bridge. And the whole night, she hadn't done anything good. Whenever she was playing the hand, terrible. So she bid the hand, and he had the best hand ever. And he was like, aha, if I never bid, she'll play the hand, and she'll make it, and she'll be happy. So he just kept passing, even though he shouldn't do that. And the opponents wouldn't let her play the hand. They were bidding, even though they couldn't. And eventually, they got to a point where he didn't think she could make anything, because it was getting pretty high. And he says, OK, what can I make? And he bid to make all the tricks, and he took all the tricks. So if they had shut their mouth, they would have got a good board. But after all, he's like, all right, that's enough. Now it's my turn. And that's what happened here. The last several moves, White's been attacking, attacking, attacking. Eh, he's not really attacking now. Now it's my turn. So my turn is rook takes c2. Yeah. Now I took a piece, and all his pieces are hanging and trapped. He still went, no. And he, he was in time trouble. He took. I took the rook. He moved his king to safety. <laughs> ah, my favorite move of the game, right next to me. Beautiful. Beautiful. Here, and checkmate. And when I checkmated him, I didn't say checkmate, because I thought it was checkmate. So I took the pawn. I didn't hit the clock. And he picked his king up. And I was like, no, nah, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> and he was like, ah. Yeah. Maybe. No, but I like the way my queen did a little you know, rigmarole there. Yeah. Uh, hooray. So, so that actually worked, because when I opened the position up with d5, my rook and his queen were lined up. Now, the first game I showed you by accident, because I'm the greatest teacher ever. <coughs> the last game, I'm going to show you the two key positions Okay, uh, from the hedgehog from the last round. I had three games that went over five hours. You know what I'm talking about. All your chess games go over five hours each. OK, so it's a hedgehog. You see all my pawns? But it didn't work out well, because these are here. Question. That's correct. That happens in the hedgehog. That's part of the, the, the lecture. And when they're all lined up, then they defend all the squares. He can't go anywhere. Now, in the hedgehog, if you remember the last game, and you don't, I played d5, and my rook and his queen were here, and so forth. Well, I always want to play d5, because I'm not playing b5. I'm, I'm not doing that. Not playing b5. Now, d5 is a bad move, because it loses. So I didn't play it here, because he takes with check, and I resign. I don't want him to take with check, so I moved my king. That was to set up d5. He was oblivious, 
That's why he's the champion and I didn't win. He played g4. And now I still can't play d5 because if I play d5 and he takes my bishop and I take with check and he takes, I lose a piece. I can't take his bishop because he takes my rook. So I have to make one more preparatory move for d5 and hope he doesn't see it. I played rook to f8, and now I'm threatening d5. It doesn't look like I'm threatening d5. It looks like I did some of that action. And he didn't see d5, and he played f5. He was hoping I would play e5, and my bishop is very suspicious. So when I played d5, he was shocked. And he thought for 10 minutes. Julian is appalled at the 10-minute thing. He's like, what? 10 minutes? And the idea behind d5 isn't all this nonsense. It's that my bishop is attacking his bishop. Um, he played the best move, bishop to c1, although every move is equally good, actually. I took with check, and he took back, and now I made a mistake, after which I'm worse, and then I made a mistake after which I'm lost. Yay! <laughs> after making the equalizing move. The correct way to play is to take with check, and then play g6 check. I thought this was bad, because he would play king e6 and start taking my pieces. What I didn't see was bishop to d6, which looks like it hangs my bishop. But then I play rook e8 check. And his king can't stay on his rook unless he goes here and gets checkmated. Then he didn't stay on his rook. So he would have to move his king here, and I would play rook takes rook check, and I would have a rook for a bishop. So I would have the advantage. And I didn't see the move bishop d6, so I thought this was not playable. That was the first thing that I missed. So I played a move where I'm not equal, I'm worse. I played rook takes rook. He played rook takes rook. I checked. He took. And I played rook e8. And this was my whole point when I played the move d5. And the idea is I'm keeping his king out. If he plays king here, which if he had done that, I, I'd have more money in my pocket now. <laughs> I would play bishop a3 check attacking his bishop. He would play king f7. I would play check. And if he plays king to g8, I simply take his bishop. If he plays king to f8, I play another discovered check. Two discovered checks in a row, and then I win his rook. So when I played rook to e8, I knew that he couldn't play king to e6. So I was going to play g6 check next to move. But then I was like, hmm, he has a really good move here. I hope he doesn't see it. And of course he did. Rook h3, attacking my pawn. If my pawn moves, then he comes in this way. And then I'm going to lose some stuff. And now I have a chance to draw, but I missed it because I had 14 seconds on my clock to make three more moves. I should play g6, bishop d8 check, rook e7 check. And then this makes a queen because he promoted it. Oh, that's beginner class. King c6. Rook takes pawn, and now my rook can get active. And I'm a pawn down, but I have good chances to draw because my rook is doing really good. And I can play f5 and get a pass pawn. And my computer says I'm slightly worse, but probably not losing. But I didn't see any of that, so I didn't do any of that. And with seconds left on my clock, I played the terrible move bishop f8. And he was like, yum, 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 <laughs> rook take. And now I made a much worse move. You'll notice my pawn is pinned, and you'll notice my king is on a dark square, so bishop f4 check could be annoying. So to stop all of that, I could play king c6. Now my pawn's not pinned, and bishop f4 is not check. And I'm slightly losing. I'm losing, but I might not lose. But I played rook e1, attacking his bishop, and he attacked my pawn. Uh-oh, and I can't move my pawn because it's pinned. But I can defend my pawn. Now my bishop's really good. No. Bishop f4 check, rook h8. Now I'm a pawn down, my king is worse, and my pawns are all in the wrong color, and my bishop can't move, and it's attacked, and his king's coming in. Um, so that worked out really badly. OK, now to show you the end of the game, because the end of the game was cool, we got this position. Uh, check, check, rook f6. OK. And hmm, I'm going to say here. 
No, I'm going to say here. OK. In this position, I played rook f5. And this got quite funny, I mean, for him. He played rook d6 check. If I play king c5, I thought he would trade rooks. Check, takes, takes, takes. And then uh, my pawns can be attacked by his bishop, and this pawn's queening, so I would be losing. I wouldn't have any play, I would just lose. So I wanted to keep the rooks on the board so I could trick him later. Boy, did I trick him. I tricked him into checkmating me. OK, so, well, I should still do that and lose, I guess. But I play king b7. And he played rook d7 check, and this is very annoying. Because I have four legal moves, and they all get mated, except one, the one I don't want to play. If I play king c6, he plays checkmate with advantage. If I play king a6, he plays bishop to b8, and rook a7 mate is annoying. If I play king c8, he plays rook check, and rook c5 discovered check, and my rook is hanging. I didn't like any of that. So I had to play all the moves that avoid that, king a8. I really hate that because I'm sitting down. Terrible. OK, and he wanted to come meet me. Instead of making a queen, he came to meet me. And I thought he would play king here and king takes pawn and mate me. And the computer wants me to play bishop here, bishop e3 and defend my pawn. But I wanted to win a pawn, so I played rook here. And rook takes pawn to defend my pawn. Hey. And he checked. And being a grandmaster, I played the only legal move. And he checked me again. Now, the obvious move is king to a6. But I keep getting checkmated the same way. And then rook a7 checkmate with advantage. So I have to play king to a8. Actually, that's not what he did. He played bishop to b8 check. That's the checkmate. If king a6, rook d7, rook a7 mate. So I played king a8. Now, the computer announces mate. And I saw the mate, so I was ready to lose. But my opponent didn't play the mate. So I got to suffer more. Um, he can play c5. And the idea is, if I take, he plays bishop d6 check, bishop c5 check, and mate. If I don't take the pawn on c5, and I just make some random move, he plays check, and check, and rook here mate. So c5 is mate. Computer says this mates. But he didn't do that. He played rook g8. And I was like, man, he could play c5 next move and mate me again. How do I stop that? So I played bishop a3, which does stop that mate. And he played bishop d6 check. I made the only legal move, because I'm good. Rook a7 check. again. If I play king a6, bishop b8, and rook a7 mate, so I went back. And now he played here, attacking all of my pieces. And here I resigned. If I don't resign, I have to take this. And he would take. And then I would resign. But I guess I could move my bishop. And he would take this. And then I would resign. Because my can't move my king and he's getting two queens. He could play here, 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 here. Hard to stop. Yeah. Also, he could queen that pawn. Or he could take the A pawn. Yeah. And the computer says minus 35. And he's up two pawns. Man, that's the rough I tells you. Yeah. So that game took five and a half hours. Then I lost. And I won the huge prize, which I put on Facebook, $26. Thank you.